So hello, Sue. Right. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Yeah. Very nice so, to be here. Same here, Sue. So would you be able to introduce yourself to the people who are watching us so that they get an idea about you? Sure. Um, well, I'm British by origin, but I've lived more than half my life over in Southeast Asia, mainly in Singapore um, and Malaysia itself. And now I'm in Borneo, East Malaysia, and I've been here for more than 20 years. Previously, I was the, I'm a speech therapist by training, um, qualified and licensed from the UK. Back in 2001, I was introduced to educational kinesiology and I became a brain gym instructor in 2005. And I've done many, many, many brain gym courses and affiliated courses. Um, and not to say I'm a better speech therapist, but I have a slightly different way of approaching things. Um, and so a, somebody rang me a few weeks ago and they said, are you the speech therapist who does massage for kids? And I was like, yes, at last, somebody's got it. So yeah, I combi very much combine um, my speech therapy and my educational kinesiology into one package. That was, I very rarely differentiate one from the other, they, they go together. Um, I'm a mom of two stepchildren, both adults uh, living in America and UK now. One um, has ADHD. So I had that experience as a parent when she was growing up. She lived with me since she was seven years old. Um, and I have five adopted children, um, all of whom have some kind of challenges. Uh, the whole range. Um, my youngest daughter has cerebral palsy. I have a son who's nonverbal. Uh, I have two of my boys are severely dyslexic. My daughter is a slow learner due to abuse in her early years. Um, three of them have ADHD in varying degrees. One of them has um, motor dyspraxia. I mean, we have everything in my house. So when I talk to parents, I am able to talk to them from as a parent, as well as just a therapist, because I'm very aware that from my own experience, it's very easy to for therapists to sit there and uh, tell parents what they have to do once they get home. And it should be like this. It should be like that. The reality is you can't always do that. So I think sometimes people um like the like it the way i present things because i present them not only as a therapist but also as a parent understanding some of the challenges they might have at home so that oh and i'm have eight grandchildren <laughs> so yeah we have a busy house and uh lots of lots of variation in my house Wow, <laughs> that's, that's that's a lot. I mean, it's a beautiful blend of being a therapist and a parent and a grandparent, you know. So the amount of years of your experience combined with being a parent, I'm sure, you know, you add a lot of quality to the families who come to you. So, so I had a question. I see a lot of kids who have, who are in the spectrum of autism and a lot of them have echolalia. What is echolalia? Is it good if the child repeats? Should we work on avoiding or getting rid of it as parents say? I would love to know your views. Okay, well, these are my views. People have different views. So this is just my view. So echolalia is when a child repeats verbatim what has been said to them. So all children go through a stage where they repeat everything you say. But around 18 months, two years of age, children who are developing their language regularly, normally, will uh, begin to experiment. They'll begin to put together words and create their own sentences and their own utterances. Children who have echolalia, get stuck at that point where they 
just repeat exactly what you say. So when we think about things that are not going quite as we expect in speech development, we divide, we divide the challenge into either a disorder or a delay. And people always think, think of, dis, of echolalia as a disorder, that something is wrong. It's actually a natural part, a normal part of development. So I would think of it more as a delay. The children have got stuck at this level and they haven't moved on. It's not, if it happens later, if you know they're developing language okay and then they get stuck, it's not, that would also be of concern. We all children have something that we call normal non fluency around four or four and a half, where their mind is working faster than their, their mouth. Can I can I interrupt? Yeah. What fluency did you say? What fluency was that? Not normal non fluency. You see it sometimes written N N F. And it's when they they have so much they want to say but the muscles are, of their mouths are not coordinated enough yet to allow them to say it. And they will, uh, 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 uh. this is completely different, okay? Um, it's not, they might repeat what you have said to give themselves more time to formulate their response. But this is not echolalia. Echolalia, one of the defining characteristics of echolalia is that it appears to have no purpose. So for that reason, people tend to think that it's something we have to be very concerned about and we have to get rid of. In fact, the way I see it, it can have quite a lot of purpose. So it ticks the boxes for a lot of pre-language skills. It shows us that the child can imitate. It shows us that he can listen. It shows us that he can sequence. It shows us that he, um, it, usually with echolalia, the child will also imitate the intonation patterns. That we've, it shows us that he has a range of intonation. He may not yet know how to use it properly but he has those skills. So that's a positive. It can um, be a starting point for therapy or for parents to start to connect with the child because there are two types of echolalia. One is what we call uh, immediate echolalia. We ask a question, the child repeats it. Then we have delayed echolalia where Several hours after watching a TV program, the child starts speaking little phrases, repeating things from the program. So if a child is using delayed echolalia, it gives us some insight into what they're interested in, what caught their attention. I had a student who came to me a few years ago now, and he was only interested in trains. That was the only thing he was interested in. Um, and at home, they didn't have any trains. They had no trains for him to play with. But he watched a lot of TV. And when he came to me, he was didn't have anything to say, or he didn't say anything, I should say. He didn't say anything um, except to repeat little phrases from TV programs about trains. So I was able to take that as an indication that trains interested him. And we set up a train track. And we um, had all sorts of games, color games about trains, matching games. Everything was about trains. And he was so happy to have somebody interested in what he was interested in. And his language soon developed. And of course, we had to move on from trains over time. But echolalia can give us a starting point to understand where our child, what our child's interested in, and how we could get in there. Another reason, um, another good thing about echolalia is that autistic children learn language in a different way to, um, to regular children who are developing typically. And 
instead of learning individual words and then experimenting and putting them together, children on the spectrum tend to learn chunks of words. And we need to help them to learn the meaning of those individual words so that they can start playing around with them and using them. So they, they tend to learn their, their language completely differently. So when they are repeating things, it's actually an, a stage in their language development. So we shouldn't discourage it. We should work with it and use what the child is saying to, um, to teach him the meaning of those individual words. Um, also, sometimes it's a self-stim that is not so positive. Um, but again, there is a reason why children stim. And one reason can be that they are overwhelmed with sensory information. They want something familiar. So there are too many demands, there's too much stimuli, and the child feels, I can't cope with this. I'll go back to something that I know. And he starts repeating familiar phrases and uh, things from um, television programs where he feels relaxed and he feels comfortable and he feels safe. So although it's a stim, it can have the purpose, like many of the stims do, of helping the child to calm down. I I'm don't, sorry. I'm sorry. sorry, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was, I, was say, just, I was just going to say that I don't like this word stim because I feel every behavior that a child engages in has a function. And as long as there's a purpose and function, it's not self-stimulatory. It's in fact, you know, like smoke, smoking is fine, boozing is fine. That is also a way of organizing yourself. But with when kids do it, it's self-stimulatory. So I somehow don't like the word and I love that you share those views. <laughs> I'm sorry I interrupted you. No, but I think sometimes it is, it is, the stim is an appropriate word because sometimes the child is not getting, for whatever reason, they're not getting the same stimulation from their environment that we are. So they create their own stimulation. That's also not a bad thing. But if I, 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 I don't like the word because what what it conveys or rather what it has started to convey is that yes. oh echolalia get rid of it oh self stim get rid of it how do i make my child come in this you know the normal normal kind of a thing of being more neurotypical that's something i mean yes. that's what i mean you know yeah i understand so, so the last thing i was going to say is that very often the echolalia actually is is the child's way of maybe answering your question or um, expressing himself. So if you said to a child, um, do you want juice? He might say, do you want juice? As an affirmative, meaning, yes, I want some juice. Um, he might, he might, um, let me see how, how to, yeah. He might be telling you. So if he's wanting to do something, he might not say, I want to, I want to go to bed now, or I want to go and take a shower, or I want to go swimming. He might say, one, two, three, go. Because that's what he's learned to communicate that he's ready to do something. And I think what we always have to bear in mind is that these kids are doing the best that they can do. And we, it's our job as the adults, as the people who have command of language, to pick up on what the child is trying to say, how they're trying to communicate with us, and then take it from there. You know, So the child says, you say, do you want juice? The child says, do you want juice? Meaning, yes, I'd like some juice. And you can see that because he's looking at the juice or he's putting his hand out. So it's then our responsibility to, to model for him what he could say more appropriately. So if we then 
knowing that he's communicated, he may not have said it exactly as we want, but he has communicated that he wants the juice. Then we can say something like, um, oh, Marcus said, I want juice. Here's the juice. But we say the first bit very quietly. So Marcus said, I want juice. So we're acknowledging that we understand him, but we're modeling, I want juice. And the chances are he will then echo that. And that's very positive. So I think that echolalia, there is, um, we don't want to just accept it and say, hey, this is a really good thing. Let's just stick here. But we want to see why is it happening? And if we view it as a normal part of development, but just a part where they've got stuck, then how can we move them on so that they can express themselves more creatively, more flexibly? Yeah. Uh, very well said. I loved it. And there were so many pointers to people who were listening who feel that we need to get rid of Ecolalia. 